Uh, I want to thank you for coming out tonight in the rain and uh, listening to me talk about chastity. I think you're going to get a lot out of the talk. And I want to start tonight, like I do all things, in prayer. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, beloved of our soul, we adore you. Enlighten us, guide us, strengthen us, and console us. Tell us what we should do. Give us your orders. We promise to submit ourselves to all that you desire of us and accept all that you permit to happen to us. O oh God, the Holy Spirit, let us only know and carry out your will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and to the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just to clarify, I am the director of the Office of Catechetics for the Diocese of Lafayette. I was appointed in May of 2018 by Bishop Douglas Desitel, and I do assist all 121 parishes and the priests in the diocese of handing on the deposit of faith. That's what Jesus revealed to the apostles when he came in the incarnation, and it's been handed on for 21 centuries, unedited, nothing added to it or taken away from it by the Catholic Church. So you can be rest assured that the teaching of the church, irregardless of the um, habits of its members, is the truth. And um, catechesis comes from a Greek word that means to echo the faith in one's life. So how do you echo your Catholic faith in the way you live your life? And how do you share that and hand on that faith to the person next to you? That's what catechesis is about. And that's what we have not done a great job of because we have lots of people leaving the church. So we have to do a better job of pronouncing the kerygma, the resurrection, the story of salvation history, and we have to feel comfortable talking about our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, about scripture. It should be rolling off our tongue like the air that comes in and out of our mouths that helps us breathe. So we can connect with other people in their humanity and bring them to Christ's humanity. And we can be that one big body, right? We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He's the head, we're the body, the church. So tonight I want to start and I'm going to talk about chastity. That's a topic that's kind of taboo nowadays with people. It's a virtue. I'm going to start with a little video. Does anybody know who Jason Everett is? Heard of him before? Okay, he's a national chastity speaker. I actually spoke with him in Boston in October of 2017 at a youth rally. But he's got a lot of great things to say about chastity. So to introduce the topic, I want to play a little video that I haven't heard from him. Chastity is humanly impossible. I agree. But there is a God, and with him, all things are possible. Because one of the things you most quickly discover when practicing chastity on your own is, I can't do this. I'm going to fall on my face and fall on my face and fall on my face. Sometimes God lets us fall on our face enough times so we realize you're, this isn't human willpower that's going to make you pure. Purity comes from God. It's a gift from him. And if we're not asking for it, and we're not going to the sacraments, and we're not praying, and we're not plugged into the source of love, which is God himself, it's just gonna be human effort. And it'll last a while, but then you're gonna fall. And, and let's be honest, I mean, especially as guys, we cause 90% of our own temptations by what we look at, and who we hang out with, and who we choose to date. If you choose to date a girl who has strong values and purity, that's gonna make it a lot easier. Hang out with guy friends who believe in the virtue of purity, becomes a whole lot easier because you always become like your friends and then to have custody over your senses, what you see and what you hear. If you have just control over those things, your temptation level is gonna drop by about 90%. It's like we throw ourselves into the midst of all these temptations and then we complain that it's difficult. It's, is it that we couldn't do more to avoid sin or we couldn't do any less? You know, we've got to realize, lead me not into temptation. God knows the heart of man, he knows we're weak. That's gotta be our main prayer. Not to dive into the midst of all these temptations, like, well, I'm gonna be strong in that moment. It's like, no, be humble enough to say, I'm so weak, God, really, don't even lead me into temptation because I'm such a fragile person that I'm gonna make such stupid mistakes. And if we can have that humility of just like, God, I know you can, you can come through during the most difficult times, but help me just to do my own part by avoiding the occasion of sin, by guarding my eyes, and then it's doable, it's possible. God wouldn't command that which is impossible. Okay, so tonight I want to be a living witness to you that this is possible and that the person sitting next to you, the people you run to, into every day who are married and are walking through life just like you, they're actually living this out and a lot of people are unaware of it. I remember how many times when I was teaching at St. Thomas More at Catholic High, 
I'd walk around the, the halls of the school and I'd, I was teaching theology of the body to seniors and I'd run into students and they would say, who does that? And I'm like, well, you, you're around people every day in the classroom who are standing in front of you teaching that are doing this. They may not be open and public about it, but they're living out their Catholic faith in an authentic way. Don't be afraid to ask them to witness to that. So I want to do four things tonight for you in about the next 45 minutes or so. Number one, I want to show you that we're created in the image and likeness of total goodness itself. The essence of God, which is to be, is goodness itself. Therefore, since God created each one of us, and we are created in his image and likeness, and our nature as human beings, it's designed and programmed into us to pursue goodness itself. I heard that uh, the principal, Mr. Masterson, he said that Father had defined for you what virtue is. You're going to have to tolerate me because I'm going to kind of go through that a little bit as well tonight. What is virtue exactly? I think I might do it a little differently than Father did. And why do we in our human nature that's fallen and sinful, why do we have a tendency apart from sanctifying grace, the thing we lost in the fall, the very thing we receive in the sacraments, God's life within us, why do we struggle with virtue? Three, God the Father has revealed in the incarnation of Jesus Christ that we are all called to chastity in our vocation. I will show you biblical, historical, traditional, and church documents, objective reality that's been that way for 2,000 years that was revealed by God. That all those things are here and that they apply to every single human person. Whether you're living a single life, the religious life, or the vocation of marriage. And that's what vocation is. Your occupation is not your vocation. Your vocation is a single life, the religious life, or your spouse. We get those two things confused sometimes. I know I did for a long time in my Catholic faith. What we're called to do and who we're called to be are two different things. And number four, what happens to the world around us when we choose to love that way? Because you're going to find out tonight love is definitely a decision. It has nothing to do with the way you feel. And when we witness that love to others, how can we make God's reality and his presence in the world real for the people around us? That's the four things I want to do tonight in this talk. Okay, so virtue and vice. In the creation account, in Genesis chapter 1, we have a monotheistic people, right? The Jews, who believed in one God. Yet when you look in Genesis 1.26, the first thing you see in the text says, let us create them in our image, in our likeness. It's an inference to a Trinitarian God. One being subsisting in three different persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in Genesis chapter 2, the second creation account, we see that God on the seventh day, right, of creation, he seals a covenant bond of marriage that is embodied in a one flesh union between a man and a woman. And that one flesh union of a man and a woman is not a metaphor or an analogy of the type of, reation, you know, the type of relationship that the creator wants with his creation. It's a reality that we see in Adam and Eve, and we're descendants of Adam and Eve. And if you think about it, one being subsisting in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we say often that God is love, right? You've heard that. God is love. Well, let's think about somebody that loves, right? A love always has a beloved. And the exchange of love between the love and the beloved is a third person. So there is three in one. And we see that in the union between a man and a woman, right? Because when a man and a woman come together and they get married, when they consummate their marriage, their union is now two in one. And we have living proof tonight that nine months later the love becomes so real they give it a name and now their union is not two in one, it's three in one. What is that a visible sign of the invisible reality of in the world? The inner life of God. Because the inner life of God is a communion within a union of three persons that subsists totally of self-sacrificial love. A love that always wills the good of other as other over oneself. Can you get a better good than that? No. And you and I are created in the image and likeness of God. So we're created to love that way. And you say, well, God is immaterial, right? And we're material beings, right? We occupy space within time and space and area, right? We're made of matter. God is immaterial. But I always used to tell my kids, 
What you do doesn't define who you are. Because we subsist of both body and soul. Our body is our material nature, and our soul is an immaterial nature. And how both those things image God and the whole person that you are is that in your intellect, right, in your will, in your soul, you mirror God. You can come to know what's true, what's good, and what's beautiful. And you can choose to will that for yourself. But more importantly, the way you image God is that you can choose to will that, not just for yourself, but more importantly, for the person right next to you. And in what we are in our humanity, we do not like to be alone. As human beings in our nature, we long for relationships. We long to be in communion with other people. And we see that communion that subsists within the Trinity, within the marital union of man and woman, and in friendships and in bonds that we have with other people. We're all united by the Eucharist and we're one body in Christ. So we're in communion together through the Eucharist. So in that way, we too image God, right? We are relational beings. Now, what is virtue? Well, it actually comes from a Latin word, the word ver. And ver means mankind. So that means all of humanity, not just male or what? Or female. All of humanity. All right? And what is a virtue by definition? It's a firm disposition or a habit of doing what is good. Now, if we're creating the image and likeness of God, and we're in, have it programmed in our DNA, in our human nature, to pursue goodness, then the natural inclination we could have and should have before the fall is to pursue goodness. But what happened in the garden? We fell. And we had this stain that's left, right? On us called original sin, and in our baptism it gets washed away. But we still have a tendency towards sin. Anybody remember this from catechism class? It starts with a C. Concupiscence. Paul writes about it. In Romans chapter 7, verse 15. He says, I do not do the good I want, I do the evil I do not want. And I don't know why I do it, but I do it anyway. But welcome to humanity. How many times have we acted one way in a situation and walked away five minutes later and said, man, I really didn't want to do that. I don't know why I did it, but I did it anyway. Because we have a tendency towards sin. We have a tendency to choose ourselves in the moment, to seek our own personal benefit and pleasure over the person next to us. So that's a vice. It's the opposite of virtue. And I have up there that true freedom in its definition is not what we see here in the United States today. License is what we see in the United States. I want to do what I want, when I want, how I want, whenever I want. That's what we define freedom as in this country. But the truth of the matter is, in our nature, freedom is to pursue the good. And it's not only to pursue our own good, as I said earlier, it's to pursue the good of the person next to you. So a vice is the firm disposition to pursue pleasure for one's own self. Now, anybody know who Doc Thomas Aquinas is? He's a doctor of the church. He's a medieval scholastic. He wrote something called the Summa Theologiae, and he identified why it is in our humanity in that writing that we have a tendency to pursue pleasure and avoid doing things that are difficult. He called it effeminacy. Now, that word you might think of in a different light today. You think maybe effeminacy might mean that there's a guy out there who is exhibiting, instead of exhibiting masculinity, is exhibiting qualities that would be more feminine. But that's not the effeminacy that Thomas Aquinas is writing about. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It impacts everybody exactly the same. So what is effeminacy? So I put this up here because, once again, it reflects the typical cultural reaction when you say that word. Oh, this man is effeminate. He has feminine qualities. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about in our own human nature, whether we're male or female, that we have a willingness, or an unwillingness, I should say, to put aside the pursuit of one's pleasures in order to pursue something that's arduous and difficult. In John 8, 34, Jesus says, whoever is, commits a sin is a slave to sin. And sometimes in our human nature, our intellect, which is the highest, form, you know, the highest faculty of our soul, it should be dictating to our will and to our nature how we act, instead of our passions dictating to our intellect and our will what we do. And oftentimes in our fallen state in the absence of grace, we submit to our passions. They kind of dictate what we do. And if we feel strongly enough about something, we can say, hey, you know what, if I feel strongly enough about it and in my heart I think it's okay, irregardless of how much objective evidence there is to show that I'm wrong, I'm right. Part of that is because of concupiscence. We have a darkened intellect and a weakened will. 
And part of that is because of our tendency toward being a slave to sin. We think we're controlling our passions and our sins, but in re reality, I think we find out in our life sometimes that our sins are controlling us. So during Lent, you want to go to confession, right? You examine those things. I was sitting in Mass a few minutes ago, and they talked about Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out or be thrown into Gehenna. He's not meaning literally cut your hand off, your foot off, or pluck your eye out. He means take the thing that's the root cause of your sin that separates you from me and extract it from your life. Detach yourself from that in your life so you can be attached to me. And we have a tendency not to do that because in our fallen nature, we don't want to master ourselves. So effeminacy is the enemy of self-mastery. And self-mastery is possible. It's possible with grace, just like Jason Everett said in the video we just watched. Thomas Aquinas also taught that grace, sanctifying grace, the very life of God itself that we lost in the fall, it builds on our human nature. So in 2 Peter 1, 4, it says we're partakers of the divine nature. In other words, you've all heard John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, right? That whoever may believe within him may not perish, may have eternal life. And in John 3, 17 says, God didn't send his son in the world to condemn it. He sent his son in the world to save it. We, a lot of Protestants, like to quote that. It's like a minute, it's a gospel in miniature. Here's a better explanation of the gospel than that. God became a man to redeem humanity so man could participate in the divine life of God. And when we partake of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, and we connect ourselves completely to his humanity, which coexists with the divine nature and the one person of Jesus Christ, we participate in his divine nature. And his love streams through us, and it empowers us. It builds on our nature. And our prudence, our justice, our temperance, and our fortitude, those are the four cardinal virtues. Every one of us as human beings has those. But in our fallen nature, we're not always moderate. We don't always make the best decisions. We don't always give the person next to us our just due. And many times in front of others, because we're more worried about what the world thinks than what God thinks, we're not courageous about the truth. So with the grace flowing through us to be able to do that, we can stand in front of people, we can, we can witness to our faith. All right, so grace builds on nature. And chastity, the, the virtue we're looking at tonight, it's rooted solely in temperance. When St. John Paul II was a young priest, even as a bishop and a cardinal, he'd often go on hiking trips and kayaking trips with young people, high school, college students. And they said he wouldn't lecture them, but he would listen intently to them and then ask them questions that would guide them closer to the truth. On these camping trips, John Paul II would bring with him portions of a manuscript that he was writing that would later become the book called Love and Responsibility that was foundational to the theology of the body. If love is winning this battle in our hearts, one of the fruits of that victory is the virtue of chastity. Now John Paul II said that chastity can only be thought of in association with the virtue of love. And this is going to be a journey, it's going to be a hike, it's going to be an uphill battle and it's going to take a lot of effort. But don't give up when it gets rough. If you fall down, get up and keep trying because if anything is worth it, it's love. God is love, right? But what is real love? And how is real love associated with chastity? How are they directly created and intimately connected to one another? If you have never taken a course on theology of the body, it's not about sex. It's about the human person. I want to encourage you to do that. And we have forgotten the nature of the human person. And it's why the world and its message has such power over us. And as Catholics, it's time for us to stand up and be able to voice why we believe we believe with conviction and courage and know it and sell it the way that the secular world is selling what it's selling us because it's selling us a lie. What is real love? It's willing the good of other as other over myself. 
That's what Jesus Christ did in the garden. If he was operating on feelings alone, I doubt seriously he'd have gone to the cross. Father, not my will be done, but thy will be done. So what is real love? I often tell my students we should love people and use things. But oftentimes in our society, we get just the opposite. What's ordered becomes disordered. What looks to be true is actually false. That's what the great deceiver does, huh? John 8, 42, he was a liar from the beginning. He is the father of lies. So what looks true is actually false, and what's false, right, actually looks true. It's a deception. So we should love people and use things, but in society, oftentimes, in our concupiscence, in our fallen nature, our actions say otherwise. We say we love things, and we end up using people. One is real love. One is counterfeit love. There's a difference. You can always judge whether something's love or not because love always gives, it never takes. The way someone loves you should be a love that is giving toward you, totally self-sacrificial. That's the way we were created to love and that's the way we've been empowered to love through the Eucharist and a participation in the divine life. Lust always takes. It's not about giving, it's just the opposite. Our culture is very confused about what real love is. The original New Testament was written in Koine Greek. So in Greek, there are four words for the word love. Storge, philia, agape, and eros. Storge is the love my father sitting back there has for me as a son, and the love I have for him as a son and him as my dad. I don't have a biological brother, but I have a lot of good friends. One of them is the godparent of my third child. I have a filial love toward Lance Struther. He's the campus minister at St. Thomas More Catholic High School. He's one of my best friends. I have a brotherly love toward him. I have an erotic love toward my wife. And that erotic love toward my wife, through divine grace, has become more of agape because I'm willing to put her needs before my own, which is probably why after 17 years of marriage, and she's willing to do the same for me, we're still together. I think anybody here has been married that really knows that can probably attest to that. So when we read scripture and we come across 1 John 4, 8, which everybody loves to quote, whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. We automatically assume from a 21st century perspective that means eros. That's how we associate the, in the English language. We say, look, I love ice cream and I love my wife. You know I mean something different, but oftentimes that word is taken to mean exactly the same thing. It's not eros, it's agape. And in 1 John 4, 16 it says, perfect love casts out fear. So the opposite of fear, right? I mean the opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. So when we act in fear, we self-preserve. When we act in freedom, we self-give. So we can measure our actions that way. If someone's acting in fear, they're gonna self-preserve the way they're treating you. They're gonna preserve themselves. If they love you, they're gonna put you first. And that's what we've been created to do in our humanity. And through divine grace, we can do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 8. You go to weddings, you hear it all the time, huh? Love is patient, love is kind. It's not rude, it's not pompous, it's not jealous. Or self-seeking or quick-tempered doesn't brood over injury, or rejoice in wrongdoing, it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That love never fails. It didn't fail on Calvary, and it won't fail now. And when Christ came and he laid down his life for everyone, he did it for the sole intention of throughout time and space for all eternity, to will the good of other as other over himself. And if my, mom, my memory serves me right, Christ was a celibate man. He lived chaste his whole what? Life. In that same passage, Paul goes a little further along, right? I love this quote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. When I was a child, I used to talk as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. In other words, when I learned how to love in a mature spiritual way, the world didn't revolve around me anymore. It revolved around everybody else next to me. 
So we talk about raising children biologically from infancy to adulthood, and we give them all the things they need in order to be able to do that. But God is fathering us. He's raising us spiritually, and we're all on a journey, and everybody's at a different spot. But how do you measure spiritual maturity? Well, you know that you've grown up spiritually when, honestly, you can look at your life and obsess it objectively and be honest and say, you know what? For the majority of the time, I have my moments of selfishness, but my life is not about me anymore. It's about somebody else. Then you've grown up spiritually. Spiritual maturity is accompanied by chastity. I'll give you an example. Okay, I want to juxtapose, and I'm trying to do that for you. The anthropology, the nature of the human person, the origins of who we are, why we're here, and what our purpose is from a church's standpoint versus the one the world gives you. The world is hopeless. It just says we're some random uh, composite of atoms that accidentally evolved here out of nothing, which means that in the ultimate philosophical place of that, our life is meaningless. But if we're created in the image and likeness of God, and our soul is created, and it's united to matter, and we're a whole person that's destined to be with God for all eternity, our lives have infinite meaning. And that's the two options you got. Because one will justify living a conjugal life one way, and one will show you why you should live a conjugal life in another way. A conjugal life is celebrated within the sacrament of marriage between a man and a, a woman. Okay, first of all, chastity is not celibacy. A lot of people confuse these two things. A priest like Father McIntyre, he chose willingly to embrace chastity for the duration of his life. He, he's a celibate man as a priest. Everybody else in this room who's not a priest is called to chastity, whether they're in their single life or guess what? I've been married for 17 years and I practice chastity within my marriage. And I guarantee you, if I gave you some examples tonight and you've been married long enough, you could think of times when you practice chastity in marriage as well. And that's not something the church created. That's something the church has preserved that it received and hand it on for the benefit of all humanity for 2,000 years. Chastity is not abstinence. Abstinence, I remember being at a public high school, went to Lafayette High. I remember being at a public high school when they presented um, contraception as a choice, right? And why would I want to abstain when I was in high school? Well, I was trying to get education. I didn't want to have a kid. I didn't want to get a disease. That's more about like self-preserving. It really wasn't looking out for the best interest of the person next to me. But when I practice chastity, then I could be looking out for the best interest of the person next to me because I'm looking out for what's best for them. And I'm looking about, out for that and it's more important than what I in that moment think is best for me. So I'm making a decision in that moment for what's best for them. So chastity is about looking outward. And abstinence is the same thing as the world. It's about looking inward. And a lot of people do this with a false autonomy of conscience. That means I have authority over my conscience. And this is a sign of, and I, I'm, I'm a victim of this. I'm going to share a story with you about how I discovered this about myself at the end of the night. I lived this way for a really long time. And I was very spiritually immature because the world revolved around me for a long time. So I had a little boy in a wheelchair who's going to be a lifelong paraplegic that taught me what real love is all about. And, you know, when I was younger, like many people, I would date people like we see people dating today. I would, you know, um, one of the sins against chastity is fornication. And a lot of people can justify fornication in a lot of ways. And a lot of times they get backed up by people from the church who are misguided and give them one part of the catechism without giving the rest of it. It's like leading a part of the gospel or part of scripture out of context and not reading all of it together. Then you don't really get the full meaning of what it's all about. So, for instance, a lot of people to comfort people will say, listen, in, a, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1790, it says, a human being must always obey the certain judgment of his conscience. If he were to deliberately act against it, he would condemn himself. Yet it can happen that moral conscience remains in ignorance. Ignorance doesn't mean you're dumb, it means you don't know. And making erroneous judgments acts to be performed already committed. So if you've already done something that's bad and you're in ignorance of it and you really don't know it, and in your conscience you think it's okay, then they kind of leave you there. They don't give you the next two paragraphs, which I think are really, really important, to kind of looking at a whole moral issue when you're trying to make a decision. 
So they make you think that if you feel strongly enough about it, and it's in your conscience, and you're okay with it, then God's not going to think there's anything wrong with it, even though he revealed long ago that you're not the arbitrator of your conscience. He is. Because we don't belong to ourselves, we belong to him. And in paragraph 1791, this ignorance can often be imputed to personal responsibility. This is the case when a man or a woman, mankind, takes little trouble to find out what is true and good. Remember, if we're creating the image and likeness of God, what are we supposed to be pursuing? Truth, which is pure goodness. But in our fallen nature, we like our sin, we like our pleasure. So we don't pursue the good. This is called a sin of omission. I was a victim of this for a long time. If I love somebody and I was ready to commit my whole life to them, I could give myself to them. And if I felt strongly enough about it and I love them and they love me, there was nothing wrong with it. Well, I'm going to show you a little formula in a little while that shows you that, yeah, there is something wrong because it's, it might be an act of love. I don't question that. But the question is, does that act of love mirror the act of love that Jesus showed his bride, the church? That's the measuring stick. Or when conscience is by decrees almost blinded through the habit of committing sin. He who commits a sin is a slave to sin. In such cases, the person is culpable for the evil he or she commits. That means we're responsible for it. Don't get a green pass for that. 1792. Ignorance of Christ and his gospel. Bad example. Scandal. Given by other people. People you know and love who say, oh, you know what, I'm doing this and I'm a good person. Good doesn't get you into heaven. Holy does. Holiness does. Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone, that level of holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness. Sanctity is fulfillment. Enslavement to one's passions. My feelings dictate what I do. And it's okay. Assertion of mistaken notion of autonomy of conscience. I'm in charge. It's my way. Frank Sinatra, huh? He, he wrote the theme song to hell. I did it my way. It's God's way. Rejection of church authority and her teaching. Why? Because in the individualistic society we live in, the final authority needs to lie in us. That's more Protestant than it is Catholic. Catholic is communal. Protestant is individual. I don't need anybody to interpret the Bible but me. Why? Because the final authority lies in me. No, the final authority lies in something outside of you. Because your existence is contingent on something outside of you. You didn't create yourself. A lack of conversion in your life. Father spoke about it. Ongoing conversion. That doesn't mean you have to get all this right in one minute, okay? I've been at this for 10 years with my son. i still got a lot of things i got to work on. If my conversion wasn't five minutes ago, my last one was too long ago. Charity is the Greek word there, or the Latin word is caritas, it's love, lack of love. A love that wills the good of other as other over itself. These can be at the source of error and judgment in all moral conscience. Do we really examine our conscience before we go to confession? These are the things we should be examining when we go into the, to confess. And like I said, here's Jesus in the garden, right? If he'd been working on feelings alone, I doubt seriously he'd have gone to the cross. He didn't. He made an active decision to will our good for our good for all eternity over his own. And that's what real love is, and that's why we have a crucifix over every classroom door in a Catholic school and in every Catholic church. So we have a constant reminder of the kind of love we've been called to live out as Christians for the person next to us. And we've been empowered to do it by the Eucharist. Teaching on chastity is found in Scripture. So let's talk about it for a second. Okay, first of all, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians around 56 AD. It's a church he settled early in his second missionary journey in Acts of the Apostles, between Acts 16 and Acts 28. And in this early budding church, Corinth was a seaport city, and there was a temple on the, uh, the top of the mountain overlooking the port, and it was for temple prostitutes. It was a place of vice and a place of lust and a place of promiscuity, much like the country we live in here today. And he's writing to them, and he writes to them something very interesting. 
He writes advice to the married and the non-married. I want to break down that passage for you, okay? Okay, and first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul writes about himself and his companions, those he like ordained, because he had the same authority to ordain as the apostles did. So he handed on his office through ordination. He said, thus should one regard us, those who came, right, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The Greek word for mystery is mysterion. The Latin word for mysterion is sacramentum. What do you think the English word for sacramentum is? Sacrament. Who administers sacraments? Priests do. Now he writes in this same letter, three chapters later, advice to the married. Now I'm going to go through this with you, okay? Now in regard to the matters about which you wrote, in other words, I'm responding, right, to a question you asked me about this. You wrote to me first, and now I'm writing back to this community, giving them an answer. He's doing what every good bishop does. He exhorts. That means he praises them for doing things that are good, and he admonishes their sin because he loves them and he wants them to go to heaven. And admonishing the sinner, instructing the ignorant, and counseling the doubtful did not stop being a spiritual work of mercy because the world got politically correct. Admonishing a sinner is a spiritual work of mercy. Now in regard to the matters about which you wrote, it is a good thing for a man not to touch a woman, but because of cases of immorality, every man should have his own wife, every woman her own husband. A wife does not have authority over her own body, but rather her husband. And similarly, a husband does not have authority over his own body, but rather his wife. Do not deprive each other. I think the first sentence before that is pretty self-explanatory. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent. What does mutual consent mean? You both come to an agreement right now, we're going to be chaste. To be free for a time of prayer. But then return to one another, so that Satan may not tempt you through your lack of self-control. This I say by way of concession, however, not as a command. Indeed, I wish everyone to be as I am, celibate, chaste. I'm not like you. I'm not married. But each has a particular gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now to the unmarried and the widow, I say, it is a good thing for them to remain as they are, as I do, chaste. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should get married. For it is better to marry than to be on fire. Here we can see, right, that all of us, irregardless of our state in life, married, non-married, or religious, we're called to chastity. The church did not make up that teaching. It received it, has protected it, and handed it on. One of the greatest sins against chastity today is pornography. It's an epidemic. So I want to bring some attention to some statistics about it. I know a lot of priests, I work for 121 of them, and they don't tell me about who confesses what, but they tell me, I say, listen, is this a problem in the confessional? Because it's a catechetical issue. Yes, it is. Well, then we need to address it. And it's not just men, it's women too. These are statistics, and I have all the websites. If you want me to email them to you so you can look at the validity of them, I'd be more than happy to do that. 40 million people in the United States are sexually involved with the Internet. That's a lot. 51% of male college students and 32% of female college students first viewed pornography before being a teenager. That means before they were 12. I have a 13-year-old son at home. He's still pretty innocent. I'm very grateful about that. He doesn't have an iPhone. He's, never, he's not going to have an iPhone until he can pay the bill. And I don't really care what the world thinks about that. Because I know the dangers of putting that iPhone in his hand and letting him loose on it on the internet without having supervision. And I know the cost, and it's not worth it. 79% of men watch it once a month, but 76% of women watch it once a month. That comes from a set of booklets that have been given out by the diocese to all the parishes and the priests for Safe Haven Sunday. The bishop wrote a nice letter at the beginning of it talking about the epidemic of pornography in our society and how we need to start addressing it. 
Some priests will choose to preach about it. Some of them won't. I'm a layman. I'm going to talk about it. Because that's a problem. And we, but putting your head in the sand and not addressing a problem doesn't get rid of it. It just lets it stay there. Okay, what's the impact of this stuff on marriages? This blew me away. 47% of families said pornography is a problem in their house. That's a lot. 41% of surveyed adults admitted they felt less attractive to their partner due to their use of pornography. We are relational beings. We want to be in communion with another person. How is that helping that? It's not. It's hurting it. 30% of surveyed adults said their partner's use of pornography made them feel more like an object. We should love people and use what? Things. We shouldn't use people and love what? Things. But that's what pornography programs your mind to do. To love things and view a person as a thing so you can use people. No. We're better than that. God created us for more than, you're made for more than that. Okay, this one really blew me away, and this one's really old. I'd hate to see what it is now, 16 years later. But in 2003, and this was by lawyers in divorce court. This is where the statistic came from, a lawyer's website. In 2003, a meeting of the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, two-thirds of the 350 divorce lawyers who attended said the internet played a significant role in divorces in the past year with excessive interest in online porn contributing to more than half such cases. Wow. That was 16 years ago. I hate to see what it is now. Pornography had an almost non-existent role in divorce just seven or eight years before 2003, before everybody and their grandmother had access to it on the internet, on their iPhone, on their iPad, or any other device that's a little computer in your hand that you can get access to at 24 hours a day. Because he who commits a sin is a slave to sin, and instead of you controlling it, it slowly begins to control you. The statistics don't lie about that. Okay, this is a picture of Sister uh, Lucia. She's one of the visionaries from Fatima. I love this quote. It says here, the final battle, right, between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid. Because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought and opposed in every way. Because this is the decisive issue. However, Our Lady has already crushed the head of the serpent. Genesis 3.15, huh? I put enmity between you and the woman. You will slap at her heel and her offspring. He will crush your head. The woman is Mary, and her son is Jesus, and he is crushing the head of the serpent, who is Satan. In 2006, 13 years ago, I hate to see what it is now, a survey report said 15% of all Christian men and 20% of all Christian women are addicted to pornography. That's like saying I'm a Christian and abortion's okay. It doesn't really go in the same sentence. Sixty percent of the women who answered the survey admitted to having significant struggles with lust. That's a vice. It's a sin against chastity. Forty percent admitted to being involved in sexual sin in the past year. This is Matt Fratt. He's a national speaker on pornography. I just want you to give a listen to what he has to say. It's been said that the problem with pornography isn't that it shows too much, but actually that it shows too little of the human person. You see, pornography reduces a person with all of his or her complexity, individuality, to a sort of lowest common denominator, two-dimensional thing that we consume instead of enabling us to recognize them as a person created in the image and likeness of God. You know, John Paul II once said that the human person is a good towards which the only proper attitude is love. The reason porn's wrong, it's got nothing to do with sex being bad. Sex was God's idea, right? It's got nothing to do with nudity being bad. Whose idea do you think that was? It's the very fact that you and I have this incredible dignity that pornography's wrong to begin with because you can only degrade that which has 
inerrant value. Nobody talks about degrading washing machines or mud. It's precisely because you and I have been made in the image and likeness of God that we have this tremendous dignity that pornography is to be avoided. And you and I both know this is not just a male issue. This is a human issue. So many beautiful young men and women are struggling with masturbation, pornography, both. And look, I just want to say this to you, that you and I have been raised in a pornified culture, haven't we? And that wasn't our fault. I mean, did we ask for that? No, we didn't. This is just what we were given. Maybe you remember the first time you were exposed. You remember that? That wasn't your fault either. The fact that you liked what you saw, that you wanted to see more, not only is that not your fault, that's natural. You and I have been wired in such a way as to find sex attractive and interesting. The very first commandment in the Bible from God to humanity is Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And God says, be fruitful and multiply. Sex is God's idea. Sexual desire is God's idea. Pornography is to be avoided because it distorts that, making what is true, good and beautiful something that's false, bad and quite frankly ugly. Over the last 40 years, there has been a wealth of scientific evidence coming out of things like sociology, neurology, psychology. And all of this stuff is saying that porn isn't good for us. You know, sometimes people will argue as follows. They'll say, porn isn't addictive because only drugs can be addictive and porn isn't a drug. And that's true, right? People don't inject porn or inhale porn. But I shared this with a neuroscientist friend of mine, and he said, Matt, this way of thinking is hopelessly out of touch with what we now know through modern neuroscience. It's true that porn isn't a drug, but it does, porn, elicit powerful neurotransmitters in the brain, which the brain can become addicted to. When the pathways are used compulsively, a downgrading occurs. And dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, which uh, plays a key role in the pleasure reward centers of our brain, this neurotransmitter begins to shrink and the pleasure cells in the middle of our brain are now starved for it. I had a neuroscientist say to me, it's now as if we've reset the pleasure thermostat in our brain. And so now the one in the addicted state needs more of that drug, whether that be cocaine, dope, whatever, or pornography, in order to feel aroused and excited. So what is all of this science? What does it all mean for our lives? Well, a lot of things. For one, we're beginning to see more and more sexual dysfunction in both men and women. If you have been wondering why you've been seeing more commercials for Viagra, etc., the reason is as close as internet pornography. People like Dr. Abraham Morgan Thaler, who's the clinical urologist at Harvard Medical School, are speaking out about what he calls porn-induced erectile dysfunction. Dr. Marianne Layden, a psychologist from the Northeast, is saying that in her clinical experience, those who are addicted to pornography tend to have problems with premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction. This is very serious. And not only does it affect us physiologically, but it affects us mentally as well. The Catechism of the Catholic Church gets it right when it says that pornography immerses all who are involved in the illusion of a fantasy world. Now, when you and I go to pornography, it's not because we're wicked people and we want to kind of objectify people necessarily, right? We go because we perceive there to be a good and we want that good. But let's think about what those goods are. We might go for excitement. But we end up bored, as Jason Everett has said, bored with perhaps some of the most beautiful bodies on the planet. We go because we're lonely and we want to feel close to someone, but we end up isolated. We might go because we want to be free to do whatever I want, but what happens? We become enslaved. Pornography, like all sin, promises us so much and then not only doesn't deliver, but leaves us less than we had to begin with. You know, for the last several years, I have traveled the country and internationally, speaking almost exclusively on the topic of pornography. I always joke that my mum is super proud of me. But in doing this job, I've had the great privilege of working alongside not only young men and young women who would say they're addicted to pornography, but people in the sex industry as well. So former male porn performers, female porn performers, strippers, prostitutes, even a couple of beautiful young women who were sexually trafficked at a young age. And when we think of those in the industry, sometimes people want to make it seem like these people are just well-rounded people who love sex. That just isn't true. It's just not my experience. When I listen to the stories of these women who have left the porn industry, their stories are drearily predictable. 
They almost always involve some serious form of abuse or neglect when they were young girls or, or boys. Them trying to then process that hurt, that abuse, that neglect unsuccessfully, and then being in a rather desperate state and being preyed upon in some fashion by the sex industry. I'm telling you, this is the norm. Now, you and I would probably much rather tell ourselves as we watch porn that we're just contributing to the liber liberation of women throughout the world, but this just is false. You know, Dr. Marianne Layden is a clinical psychologist from the Northeast. Listen to what she has to say. She's worked a lot with those in the sex industry and she says this, quote, once the pornography performers are in the industry, they tend to have high rates of substance abuse, typically alcohol and cocaine, depression, borderline personality disorder. She says, the experience I find most common among the performers is that they have to be drunk, high or disassociated in order to go to work. Their work environment is particularly toxic. Their terrible work life is often followed by an equally terrible home life. They have an increased risk of sexually transmitted disease, domestic violence, and have about a 25% chance of making a marriage last more than three years. You know, a friend of mine was a Playboy producer, and I remember him saying to me, Matt, you don't see what I see. I said, what do you mean? He said, you don't see the girl uh, curled up in the fetal position in between takes, sucking her thumb because of the abuse she just experienced on set. You don't see us having to kind of wipe away the tears, reapply the makeup, because she knows that if she doesn't get this scene done, she doesn't get paid. That's how it works. There is nothing adult, nothing gentlemanly about pornography. You know, I remember when I was seven years old, eight years old, that's when I first stumbled across pornography. I was playing out the back of a relative's house and I remember running into this shed for cover. I opened up this wooden trunk in the corner, rummaged around it, and there it was a centerfold of a completely naked woman looking at me. I remember I had simultaneous feelings of wonder, like, wow, this is cool. <laughs> and then also shame, like I shouldn't be looking at this, that this wasn't quite right. You know, my friends and I would then sneak into newspaper stores as we got a little older, we'd steal pornographic magazines. When I got to about be 16 or 17 years old, we'd sneak into strip clubs in the big city. And whenever I did it, I, I never felt proud of myself. You know, afterwards, I always had all this regret. I would never want anyone I respected to know that I was there. And this, by the way, is before I was a Christian. When I was 17 years old, I came to Christ and it changed my life in a very profound way. And at that point, I realized there was another reason I had to stop looking at pornography. And that's that the God of the universe created me and he created those that I was objectifying in porn with intrinsic dignity unalienable rights and I knew that I couldn't keep looking at them like this but what could I do? I didn't know how to stop. I'd go to confession, I'd go to someone to give me advice, this is what they'd say. Have you tried not looking at it? Have you just, just try a little harder? And I was thinking, thanks a lot, you know. That would be like saying to me, all right, we want you to get into the ring with this UFC fighter. Just do your best. I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna succeed. Just do your best, that's all you can do. I mean, think about it, you just get completely clobbered and I just remember thinking this is unfair. Well, let's follow that thought experiment through a little bit, okay? Suppose you could starve your opponent. In this case, it might be pornography, masturbation, sexual sin. What would happen? Well, if you starved them and, and you could gain strength by relying on the sacraments, going in prayer to Jesus Christ and begging his grace to help you overcome this, by being accountable to your brothers if you're a guy, to your sisters if you're a girl, and saying, help me overcome this, pray with me. I wanna tell you when I fall, because some things can only be healed by the antiseptic light of truth. We need to bring this out there. If we begin to educate ourselves, that's another way of strengthening ourselves. Learning about all the ways porn is hurting us, neurologically, physiologically, that's gonna really help us. Well, I dare say that after a while, you will gain strength over your opponent. So right now, maybe combating porn feels just like fighting a UFC fighter. It's not always gonna feel like that. So I just wanna say, if you're struggling with this stuff, I don't care if you looked at it this morning, last week, last year, if you look at it every day, I want you to know that God loves you. He is not ashamed of you. He knows what you're looking for. You know, there's this quote, it says, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel, that's a house of prostitution, is looking for God. I think we can say the same thing, that every young man and young woman who clicks on a porn site, what they're looking for is the fulfillment of their desires, and it's not gonna be found there. It's gonna be found primarily and solely in Jesus Christ.
If you're like I was when I was younger and you're enslaved to this stuff, pornography or masturbation, maybe you're believing what I believed and that's that I can never be free of this. And I'm here to tell you that that's a lie. You can. You don't have to keep going down this dead end path that the porn industry wants you on. You can live free of this. And so I want to share with you five very quick things that you can begin doing to start walking in freedom. The first thing is this. You and I have to look ourselves in the mirror and admit we need to change. I said earlier, you know, it's not your fault or my fault that we first stumbled across porn. And that's true. But right now you have a very important decision to make. What kind of woman do I want to be? What kind of man do I want to be? And so we we need to just decide I need to be better than this. Number two, prayer and fasting. It's been said that prayer without fasting is like boxing with one hand tied behind your back. And I guess fasting without prayer would just be dieting, which is a good thing, just not a good enough thing. Both are needed. And when we pray, we come before the Lord who loves us as we are and too much to leave us that way. Our Lord is not scandalized by us. He's not ashamed of us. He loves us and he wants us to live lives to the full. And that's a life he can give us. When we fast, what we're doing is we're denying ourselves legitimate pleasures in order to strengthen our wills to uh, avoid illegitimate ones. Put it this way. If you can't say no to that donut, how will you say no to the temptation to look at pornography? So it strengthens our wills. Number three, we've got to be accountable. There needs to be at least one person in our lives that knows what's going on. Some things can only be healed by the antiseptic light of truth. We need to bring this into the light. Of course, that means going to confession whenever we fall as well. I'd strongly suggest that you and I get accountability software like Covenant Eyes. This thing I think is indispensable for those who feel like we can't stop looking. Number four, get informed, okay? Educate yourself about all the ways that pornography is affecting you, neurologically, socially. You know, I had a young guy come up to me and he said, I can no longer look girls in the eyes at my school. I have to look at them in the middle of the forehead because I get so anxious and nervous. And he had no religious reason for saying this. He wasn't even a religious guy, but he said, I know it's because of pornography. It's affecting our lives. We need to educate ourselves so that we're going to be incentivized to be better and to be free of this stuff to fight it. Number five, the final thing I want to say is patient perseverance. You know, there is no magical cure for this thing. This is something we're going to have to fight on a daily basis. Now, I don't know if you struggle with porn or masturbation, whether you do, whether you love someone who does. Here's the thing. Sometimes when we fall to this stuff or our friends fall to this, it can be really discouraging. And I know what it's like to get really angry with myself and think I'm never going to do this again. But the fact is when we do fall, We shouldn't look at ourselves because we can become discouraged. Not to look at those who are doing worse than us and pat ourselves on the back for not being so bad. But instead, look to our merciful Savior who died on the cross for us. And that should encourage us to run to the sacrament of confession, to confess this sin and allow him to free us from it. My friend Mark Hart has said the only sin that God cannot forgive is the one that you and I won't ask forgiveness for. So let's push down our pride and run to that sacrament of confession and confess it. Porn is wreaking havoc in our society, in our lives personally, in our relationships. I think we can all agree that what we don't need is more consumers of pornography and that what we need is men and women who are willing to stand up and fight for authentic human love. That's my invitation for you today, to be those men and women and do that because we've been equipped to be able to do it. All the psychological, physiological, sociological studies point to the truth, the statistics do what the church has been teaching for 2,000 years about the integrity of the human person. And the very people that espouse promiscuity talk out of one side of their mouth because the lifestyle they're condemning or the lifestyle they're promoting is bringing about the results of their ultimately the other side of their mouth condemning. If we stop and think about that, we'd see that we could find the truth because it's there. It's a light in the darkness. You can see it. There's double use in pornography. The person consuming it uses the person and objectifies the person in it, and the person producing it objectifies the person for money. It's a stain on our society. Now, how can we identify that there's this? You know, I'm not questioning. People say, I love this person. I don't question that. 
I've, I've had human love for lots of people. I don't question that for a second. I, I get that. The question we have to ask ourselves is the acts of love that we're showing to this person, does it mirror the love Christ, the eternal bridegroom, showed for his bride, the church? And there's four things you can ask yourself in any act of love you're going to show to another person. I'll give you that answer. Was it total? Was it free? Was it fruitful? And was it faithful? This is my body, blood, soul, and divinity. Holding nothing back. It's total. At the Last Supper, this is my body, which is given up for you. Freely given up for you. Is it fruitful? I'm the manna that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will have eternal life, and the food I give is my flesh for the life of the world. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have my life within you. Whoever eats this bread has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I remain in them, and they remain in me. It's fruitful. Matthew 28. Go and teach them all I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I will be with you always. Contraceptive love can't do that. Can never be fruitful. Pornography can't do that. Can never be fruitful. It's not faithful for sure. It's an act of infidelity. And it's certainly not total, because I'm saying one thing with my body and doing something else with my actions. We can't do that. And what you do when you're married in the conjugal act is you bring about the incarnational reality of the vows you say to your spouse. And you renew them in a covenant bond, which is not a legal contract, but in the exchange of persons. You belong to me, and I belong to you. Just like Christ on the cross, I, the bridegroom, hold nothing back, and neither does my bride. He consummated his marriage to the world on Calvary. Our body speaks a language. We want to speak the same language, right, as our actions. When I got the job at the chancery, I'm going to close with a story. You've been very attentive, and I really appreciate it. I chose this passage to kick off my campaign as the catechist and the director of catechetics. It's from St. Pope Paul VI in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Nasiunde. It just means the new evangelization. It means to go evangelize the people in the pews who have failed to be evangelized, or the pagans in the world who have yet to be evangelized, just like the first Christians. Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than he does to teachers. What are catechists? They're teachers. And if he does listen to a teacher, it's because they're a witness. So I want to close with a personal story tonight. I'm going to witness to you about how I found out that just because I felt really strongly about something didn't mean I was right about it. How when I was wrong and admitted I was wrong and surrendered to something bigger than myself, I found a fulfillment that I would have never found any other way. In May of 2005, a former student asked me what my greatest fear was. I told him it was to have a child with a mental or physical handicap because I was such a perfectionist, I didn't think I'd handle that very well. Having no idea that in four short years, that greatest fear would become my reality. In the midst of our second pregnancy, a 16-week ultrasound revealed to my wife and I that our second child was diagnosed with a birth defect so severe that 80% of the people who received the diagnosis we did at that point in the pregnancy choose abortion. My wife and I chose to pray for a miracle. And with the aided prayer of the St. Thomas More Catholic High School community, in 2008 and 2009, we got one. I have a little boy that's going to be a paraplegic his entire life. They can't do 90% of what you and I do every day for ourselves on his own. He has taught me a love that defies logic. And he has transformed my marriage. 50% of the people in the world today get a divorce, roughly. After my son was born, I read some, some data statistically about what happens to families that have kids with special needs. The divorce rate for people that are married with kids with special needs is not 50%, it's 80%. So what do you think my prayer was? Strengthen my marriage. Strengthen my marriage. Strengthen my marriage. I had a group of men that I used to get together with at St. Thomas More. They were a prayer group. We did Bible study. There was accountability, the things that Matt Frad talked about. There was growing in our personal friendship with Christ. I met with them one night, and they asked, uh, the night we had to go around a the table, they asked two questions. They said, um, this is in my new book, Growing with Eli, this story. It was, um, if happiness was the measure of financial success, what would you do for a living? 
And if there's one thing in your life you could change, what would it be? And we all went around the table and somebody had to give an explanation of that. If happiness was the measure of my financial success, I'd go around the country doing what I'm not doing tonight, giving my testimony about my son's story, which many people have heard. It's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life. And if I could change one thing in my life, I know what it would be. I would not have waited seven years to implement the church's teaching on natural family planning in my marriage. See, when I did some research for this book, I found out that 85%, this is according to a 2013 research poll, 85% of Catholics in this country today say contraception is not morally wrong. Only 15% say that it is. Unfortunately, I used to be one of those 85%. And what I want to witness to you tonight is why I'm not anymore and how it transformed my marriage. And it strengthened it. I was beginning to share Eli's story after he had been born, and my wife and I were trying to reestablish intimacy in our marriage. When you go through a pregnancy like that, where you have to go see a maternal fetal specialist over and over again and get an amniocentesis done, and you have to wait on the birth of this child, it's going to have be, be a paraplegic, not be able to walk, have multiple health problems. It's not easy you lose the intimacy of your marriage, so you're trying to reestablish it. I had always been a contraceptor, so I figured the easiest way to reestablish intimacy in my marriage, even after I had this profound experience with God, was to keep doing that. Well, I was at St. Thomas More at the time, and a man came from one of the local parishes in the diocese because he wanted to vet me before I shared Eli's story at the parish. So he came into the school, and I wrote about this. He, he said, do you have a place we can talk? I said, sure. I said, I pray in the chapel every day. Let's go into the chapel in the tabernacle. Jesus is there. And that's why I said conversion is an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time thing, right? So I walked in there, and there was a, little, a child that was praying in there with school. And that wasn't unusual. There was usually kids in there. And he looked at me, and he said, are you sure you want to talk in here? And I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I want to talk in here. Jesus is in here. So then he asked me two questions I really didn't expect from somebody off the street who didn't really know me. He said, are you Roman Catholic? I said, well, yeah, I've been raised Roman Catholic my whole life. He said, do you believe in the magisterium? That's just a Latin word for the teaching authority of the church. So I said, well, yeah. Then he asked me something that floored me. He said, hey, do you and your wife use contraception? I thought that was a pretty bold thing for him to do. In fact, I got pretty angry, as I imagine most people would have been, feeling that they didn't really know you and they just kind of asked you a really personal question, right? So it kind of got heated for a minute, and then I walked out of there, and we reconciled, and we ended up talking, and, you know, he left, and I went back to my class, and I taught all day, and I went home, and I was driving home, man, and, you know, remember we talked about conscience earlier? My conscience was really pricking at me, you know? Because my whole life, I had known what the church taught, but I didn't want to find out why. Because if I found out why, then I might have to change my behavior. And that was my sin of omission. So I began to pray, Lord, strengthen my marriage, strengthen my marriage. So every time I turned on the TV at home, um, I would have something talking about, or I went online, look something, NFP, NFP. I mean, every time I turned something on. So at this point, I said, okay, well, um, I will look into it. So I'm reading through scripture, right? And I get to Mark chapter 10, it's the story of this rich man. And he meets Jesus and he says, look, I've kept all the commandments, right? You know, I've honored my father and my mother, I haven't killed anybody, I have not bear false witness, I don't want my neighbor's property or stuff. What do I have to do to get to heaven? And in Mark chapter 10, Jesus looks at him, and I love Mark's gospel, because it says, Jesus loved him. He met him where he was at, but he loved him way too much to leave him there. He challenged him. He said, you have many things, you're a rich man. Give up your stuff and come follow me. And the man walked away sad because he had many possessions. I don't, we don't know his name. If we'd have followed Jesus, we might, but we don't. As I was reading that, I realized I had that conversation with Jesus. I had it in the chapel at STM right in front of him. i had done all these things in my life to honor him when I had my son. I had this profound conversion experience. And I looked at him and I said, what else do I have to give up? What's the one last thing keeping me from being in total union with you and your bride, the church? Contraception. 
And when I went to study about NFP, you know, when I went to my marriage prep class, it was horrible. They had an older couple, of, well, it was a middle-aged couple. The guy made a six-figure salary. They had a bunch of kids running around. They didn't tell me that as a Catholic, you don't have to have as many kids as physically possible. But that was the impression I got in my marriage encounter. I'm just being transparent and honest, okay? I'm sure other people have had this experience. And I was about to be a school teacher. My wife was going to be a nurse. They really didn't seem like, you know, feasible. And I wasn't, I was, had a hardened heart. I didn't want to look at it, you know? And here I'm reading this stuff and I'm realizing that, um, you know, I used to think a woman can get pregnant any time. I didn't realize that in God's design of a woman's body, physiologically, only three months out of the year she can get pregnant. I mean, three, three days out of the month she can get pregnant. And that if you know the cycle of how her body works, then you can see when you're communicating with one another about something as profound as that, how you can develop this deep trust with your spouse that's not there when you're not doing that. And any relationship is built on communication and trust. So if I want to strengthen my marriage, that would be a great way to do it. If I could talk to my wife every month about that honestly, and we could discern it together, we'd be communicating, and I'd learn to trust her, and I'd learn things about her that I didn't know before because I'd learn how to love her in a way that wasn't physical. I'd learn how to choose her good for her good over my own even when I don't feel like it. And I could hear Paul's words ringing in my mind, right? Do not deprive each other except for a time for mutual consent. Then return to one another. You won't be tempted by Satan. It's 99% effective in planning or postponing a pregnancy. There's not a single artificial contraceptive on the market that can give you that type of guarantee. Let's say that again. It's 99% effective planning or postponing a pregnancy. Wow. And if you have fertility problems and you have issues with ovulation, you can pinpoint that as a woman. You can take it to your doctor and they can help eradicate it. Not with the birth control pill but with something better. And then I read Humani Vitae. Blew me away. If therefore there are well-grounded reasons for spacing births, arising from physical or psychological condition of husband and wife, the church teaches that married people may then take advantage of the natural cycles imminent in the reproductive system and engage in marital intercourse only during those times that are infertile. Thus controlling birth in a way which does not in the least offend the moral principles which we have discussed. But it is equally true that it is exclusively in the former case that a husband and wife are ready to abstain from intercourse during fertile periods as often as for reasonable motives the birth of another child is not desirable. There's a lot of ambiguity in that. You can, you know, there's nobody judging your intent there. That's between you, your spouse, and God. But it's giving you that option. And when infertile periods recurs, their use for their married intimacy do express their mutual love and safeguard their fidelity toward one another. In doing this, they certainly give proof of a true and authentic love. You know, we were told that there was a greater chance we'd have another child like Eli if we got pregnant again by geneticists. So choosing to live this out and trusting in God is an act of faith. And I did grow in my faith, but also my family also grew because I have a third child now because of this that I'd have never had had I not tried it. Another life, a beautiful life that's changed my life in an even more profound way than Eli has. My son Ezra, my third son. I have a 13-year-old, a 9-year-old in a wheelchair, and a 4-year-old. And my wife is a neonatal intensive care unit nurse at Women's and Children's Hospital in Lafayette. And I used to be a Catholic school teacher. Now I'm the director of the Office of Catechetics. And I wanted to be a history teacher and a basketball coach. You couldn't pay me to do those two things now if you asked. Then I went to scripture. In Genesis 38, 6 through 10. In ancient Israel, if your brother died, you're supposed to marry their wife and give them an offspring so your brother has somebody to have his inheritance. Onan, the, bro the brother of uh, Judah, he didn't do that. They call it coitus interruptus. It's the passage that's most often pointed to to show that scripture also defends the illegitimacy and illicit act of contraception, an intentional act to avert procreation. Look, every conjugal act doesn't have to be, um, it has to be open to life, but it doesn't necessarily have to be ordered toward it. Let me say that again. Every conjugal act needs to be open to life, not necessarily ordered toward it, because at the end, you're not the one making the decision whether life's there or not, God is. Then I went to the tradition of the early church. And we can see a, a tradition that's handed on 
throughout every generation from the first century to the 21st century. I never asked my students, do you agree with this? I asked them, is it the same teaching? And it is. It's never changed. And the church didn't create it. It received it and passed it on. So I did my homework because I'm one of those guys that wants to know why. And I wasn't too big to say I was wrong, and I was wrong. And God was right. And my marriage has benefited because of it. Here's the catechism. Periodic continence, that is, the methods of birth regulation based on self-observation and the use of infertile periods is in conformity with the objective criteria of morality. These methods respect the bodies of the spouses, encourage tenderness between them, and favor the education of an authentic freedom. In contrast, every action with which, whether in anticipation of the conjugal act, or in its accomplishment, or in the development of its natural consequences, with intention, proposes, whether as an end or as a means, to render procreation impossible is intrinsically evil. That's a mortal sin. It will separate you from God from all eternity. I wanted no part of that anymore in my life. Because I love God too much. Not because I'm afraid of God, because I love God too much. And I value how much he loves me too much. Fourth thing, um, less than 2% of people that use NFP in their marriage get divorced. Compared to 50% of everybody else, including those 85% of Catholics in that Pew Research poll in 2013, that said contraception was morally okay. They get divorced at the same rate as everybody else. You know, we buy life insurance, right? In case something happens to us to take care of our loved ones. It's a life insurance policy on your marriage. And I fail to see how any individual entity that gives a woman a pill that's been cl classified by the World Health Organization as a class one carcinogenic that causes cancer prior to the age of 30 in their first pregnancy, ovarian, cervical, or breast cancer is pro-woman. That is illogical to me. This is pro-woman. Because there's a better way to do it, the natural way, in accordance with the way you were designed by God. Suffering without love is in, it's unendurable. And love without suffering, real love without suffering is a fairy tale. I want to lay down my life for my bride the way Christ did for his church. My son in, my wheel in a wheelchair taught me how to do that. My love for him drew me out of myself, and it drew me out of myself in the way that I could love the other people in my family the way that I always intended to love them. But I was too scared because I was more worried about being the person the world said I should be instead of abandoning myself to God and becoming the person he had created me to be. Modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than he does to teachers. And if he does listen to a teacher, it's because they're a witness. At some point, I had to just let go of what I had always believed and thought would be, and began to accept what actually was. Chad has learned the value of family and what it truly means to be a dad and the importance of being present. Initially, my personal experience in waiting for Eli was a validation of my Catholicism. However, while growing into the guy who was destined to share this story, the reality is that the objective truth of the Catholic faith is what actually validated that experience. Before Eli, Chad was really just starting to look at the faith and seriously consider uh, just kind of committing to his Catholic faith. Uh, and he really began to adopt some of the Christian principles that, are, that we learn in our Catholic faith. After Eli came, it required that he begin to start living out those Christian principles. Chad and I were, and still are, in a, in a faith community together. Uh, we, we sit down and break bread sometimes and, and share our, our lives and our journey as Christians. And it's just been really, Really good to see Chad move from seeing the world from inside out rather than seeing it from outside in and uh, putting the things around him first. I think he's grown. He's 
I learned to stop and smell the roses. Every step I took toward Eli and away from the world was a step into the grace that would set the pace for me becoming the husband, the father, the teacher, and the man that God created me to be. I gave my all for your battle. I really hope that tonight I've been able to demonstrate to you that the church really does have all the arguments, but it doesn't need any more, but it desperately needs it more example. Be that example for your spouse, for your child, for your neighbor, for the world. And when you live the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith, boldly, authentically, and unapologetically, Jesus Christ, through you, he can change the world one life at a time. God love you. Thank you.